Welcome to Social Work 240, Session 2. This module will include definitions and examples of research approaches, research methods, and five quantitative research designs. Each of these different terms reflects different choices a researcher can make about how to conduct a research study. We'll begin by discussing the four types of research approaches. First, descriptive research is used when the research question is focused on describing characteristics of a population or phenomenon. Descriptive research is not focused on examining things like program effectiveness, but rather on describing characteristics of program participants or program practices. Descriptive research is most often used as a way to learn about a research topic so that other additional research questions can be asked using exploratory, explanatory, or evaluative approaches. A descriptive research approach could be used with research questions like, what is the average age of children entering the public child welfare system in California? What proportion of youth entering the juvenile justice system in California are Latino, African American, white, or Asian Pacific Islander? What is the average length of stay at a residential treatment center for adults with mental illness? All of these questions are focused on describing characteristics of certain client populations. A second research approach is an exploratory approach, which asks open-ended research questions that are focused on learning more about a topic that we do not know much about, or also exploring a topic that is hard to study using other research approaches including topics that explore things like perceptions, experiences, feelings, or processes. An exploratory approach can be used in order to learn enough about a topic to then conduct additional research, but for other topics, an exploratory approach is the main goal. An exploratory research approach could be used with questions like, how do parents who are recent immigrants from Mexico cope with acculturation challenges? How satisfied are adolescent foster youth with their social workers' efforts at finding a permanent home for them? What factors help facilitate cross-system collaboration between child welfare and mental health systems? These questions are focused on exploring experiences, processes, feelings, and perceptions, and are also focused on topics that we do not know much about. An explanatory research approach begins with a specific idea or prediction about how variables are related to one another. Within an explanatory research approach, we use the terms independent and dependent variables. An independent variable is something that causes a change in the dependent variable. A dependent variable is something that is changed by the independent variable. Explanatory research begins with an hypothesis about how the independent and the dependent variables are related to one another. An explanatory research approach could be used with hypotheses like, it is hypothesized that participation in triple P parenting classes, the independent variable, will improve parenting skills, the dependent variable. It is hypothesized that participation in mental health counseling, the independent variable, will reduce anxiety and depression, the dependent variables, among adults. It is hypothesized that cultural competence training, the independent variable, will increase social worker skills, the dependent variable. These hypotheses are specific predictions about how an independent variable will influence a dependent variable. An evaluative research approach is specifically focused on research that produces results that can be readily used in order to make program and policy decisions. An evaluative approach to research incorporates at least one of the other three research approaches. However, evaluative research questions are tailored for producing results that can be used for policy and program decisions and are therefore usually narrow and specific. Examples of evaluative research questions include, after six months of new recruitment activities, including print and media ads for potential foster parents, what is the percent change in foster parent orientation attendance? What is the average age of mothers participating in a postpartum support program? 
What do social workers who are implementing a new program feel are the strengths and challenges in the implementation of the program? Within each of the four research approaches, different types of research methods can be used. Quantitative research methods emphasize objectivity in the research process. With quantitative methods, there's an effort to collect numerical data that is precise and also to use methods that can be replicated by other researchers. Quantitative designs also use processes that help ensure that the results can be generalized to other populations that weren't included in the study. Most often, quantitative research methods are used with descriptive, explanatory, or evaluative research approaches. Qualitative research methods emphasize subjectivity in the research process. The research is focused on aspects of behavior and feelings that are not easily reduced to numbers, and there is an emphasis on exploring a topic in depth. Qualitative research methods are also useful when the research is focused on an area that not much is known about and are therefore commonly used with an exploratory or evaluative research approach. We'll return to the topic of qualitative methods and designs in session three. The remainder of this session is focused on defining and providing examples of five types of quantitative research designs. There are many different types of quantitative research designs. The five we will talk about are some of the most commonly used in social work and related fields. These research designs include group research designs, single case evaluation designs, cross-sectional, longitudinal, and case control designs. Most often, an explanatory or evaluative research approach is used with these designs. We'll begin by talking about group research designs, which are used when the research study is focused on testing whether an intervention causes a change in the participants. For example, a group research design can be used with research questions like, does participation in cognitive behavioral therapy for three months reduce feelings of anxiety among adults? Or among adults with mental illness, does a program of both medication support and housing support result in fewer emergency hospitalizations than just medication support alone? But how can we really figure out whether or not an intervention actually causes a change in a participant? In order to say that one thing causes another, three conditions must be met. The first condition is that the cause precedes the effect in time. So we have to be able to show that an independent variable came before a change in the dependent variable in order to say that the independent variable caused this change. The second condition of causality is that two variables must be empirically correlated with one another. This means that there must be a statistically significant relationship between the independent and dependent variables. This refers to the term correlation, which means that two variables are considered to be related to one another. Correlation is important, however, it does not tell us with certainty whether or not one variable is actually causing the other variable. For example, researchers commonly find a statistically significant correlation between homelessness and crime rates in communities, which means that in communities with high rates of homelessness, there also exists a high rate of crime, and vice versa. Low homelessness is associated with low crime rates. However, we cannot say that homelessness causes crime or that crime causes homelessness because there may be some other third variable out there that is actually the underlying cause of both homelessness and crime, such as unemployment. So although correlation is important, it does not tell us with certainty if one thing causes another thing. So in addition, in order to say that one thing causes another thing, the third condition of causality is that the empirical correlation cannot be explained away by some other factor or explanation. This condition is more difficult to meet because in social science research, we are working with human beings in social environments, and there can be many different factors that can influence people's behavior, feelings, or thoughts. This third condition is referred to as internal validity. The third condition is more difficult to determine, and many group research designs are focused on ruling out the possible effect of other factors or conditions that may be causing a relationship 
between an intervention and an outcome. The internal validity of research designs requires that other factors be ruled out as rival explanations for an association between an independent variable and a dependent variable. So when we say a study has good internal validity, that means we feel reasonably confident that an independent variable, which in the case of group research designs is an intervention, causes a change in a dependent variable. The reason a study has good internal validity is because other possible reasons for the change in the dependent variable are ruled out by the way the study is conducted. There are two main areas that researchers have control over that influence internal validity. These are, first, how participants are selected to participate in the intervention, and number two, how many pretest and post-test measurements of the dependent variable are collected. Pretest measurements are the measurement of the dependent variable prior to the intervention, and post-tests are the measurement of the dependent variable after the intervention. There are three types of group research designs, experimental, quasi-experimental, and pre-experimental. Each of these designs have different levels of internal validity, or in other words, different degrees of certainty that the intervention is actually the cause of a change in participants and not some other variable. The first type of group research design is the experimental group research design, and the most commonly used type of this design is the pre-test, post-test control group design, which is often referred to as the randomized controlled trial, or RCT. In this design, participants are randomly assigned by the researcher to either a treatment condition or a control condition, and then each group is given a pretest which is often a survey, but it could be some other measure of the dependent variable, such as a clinician's rating or case record information. After the pretest data collection, the treatment group receives the intervention that is being studied, and the control group does not receive this intervention, and either receives no intervention or treatment as usual. After the intervention, both groups then receive the post-test, which is the same measure as the pretest. If the intervention is effective, we would expect to see a change in participants who are in the treatment condition and no change in the participants in the control condition. This is considered the gold standard of research designs, and this is largely because the random assignment of people into the intervention or control groups helps to reduce the threat of selection bias as an alternative explanation for a change in the dependent variable. Selection bias is considered a threat to internal validity when the two groups are different in some important way because changes in the dependent variable may be due to differences between the two groups and not the intervention. Although this research design has a high degree of internal validity, it can be difficult to implement because researchers do not always have the control or ability to randomly assign participants to an intervention or a control condition. Because of the difficulties in implementing a randomized controlled trial, many social work researchers more commonly use quasi-experimental group research designs. With quasi-experimental group research designs, the degree of internal validity is lower than with the experimental designs, and this is because there is no random assignment of people to conditions. When there is no random assignment, we use the term comparison group instead of control group. The non-equivalent comparison group design is a commonly used quasi-experimental group research design that compares two groups, but without the use of random assignment. As a result, the main threat to internal validity with this design is selection bias. It's possible that the people who join the intervention group are different in some important way than the comparison group, and it is this difference that is driving the change in the dependent variable and not the intervention. Most notably, participant motivation for change might be higher among people who self-select into an intervention. And this might mean that participants in the intervention group were already involved in a change process before beginning the intervention. One way to reduce the threat of selection bias and improve the internal validity of the non-equivalent comparison group design is to use the multiple pretest comparison group design. By using two pretests, changes in the intervention group 
that are due to selection factors might have the potential for being detected at the pretest stage of the research. A third quasi-experimental group research design is the multiple time series design, which uses both multiple pretests and multiple post-tests and a comparison group. Multiple measurements of pretest and post-test data help to establish patterns of change before and after the intervention, which help to ensure that the change actually occurred after the intervention. Pre-experimental group research designs have the lowest level of internal validity, largely because these designs do not include a comparison group. However, these designs are commonly used in social work research because they can be more easily implemented in social work settings. In the one-shot case study design, a single group of participants receives an intervention and then a post-test. The main problem with this design is that we don't know if there has been a change in the dependent variable because we are only measuring it once after the intervention. Researchers will sometimes choose this design when it is very difficult to obtain pretest data or the evaluation begins after the intervention begins. This type of design can be strengthened somewhat by including post-test questions that ask participants to reflect back on their change process and rate their own perceived amount of change. An improvement on the one-shot case study design is the one-group pretest post-test design because there is a pretest so that changes in the participant can be detected. But again, since there is no comparison group, it's difficult to be sure the intervention caused the change. So far, we've talked about selection bias as a key threat to establishing a causal relationship between an intervention and a change in participants. But there are other threats to internal validity. There are several discussed in your textbook and two of these threats to internal validity that are commonly encountered are history and maturation or the passage of time. History in research terminology does not mean historical events. Instead, history means some other extraneous event that causes changes in participants. Extraneous events are outside the control of the researcher and could be many different things. For example, a researcher might be conducting a study on the effects of a support group on anxiety levels of older adults living in a residential treatment center. At the same time the group is going on, most of the participants are receiving visits from family members. It's possible that any reductions in anxiety that are found in the study are due to family member visits and not the support group. So in this example, visits from family members represent an extraneous event that causes a change in the dependent variable. In addition, maturation, or the passage of time, is another common threat to internal validity. This refers to the fact that people naturally grow and change over time, and therefore changes in the participant might be due to these natural processes and not the intervention. A second type of quantitative research design is the single case evaluation design. Single case evaluation designs examine the effects of an intervention on just one case. A case is often defined as one person. These designs are similar to group research designs, except instead of examining the effects of an intervention on a group of people, this design examines just one person and uses multiple pre- and post-test measurements to examine trends in how the dependent variable is changing. For example, a social worker might want to examine the following research question. Does the number of positive social interactions a child engages in increase while the child is participating in a behavioral training program? The figure displays a basic AB single case evaluation design. In this design, the horizontal x-axis refers to days of the week and the vertical y-axis refers to the number of positive social interactions. The line in the graph represents the point at which the intervention was introduced to the child. The graph provides a visual display of the increase in positive social interactions while the child is participating in the intervention. There are different types of single case evaluation designs, including designs that use multiple baseline time periods, and these are discussed in greater detail in your textbook. The advantages of single case evaluation designs are that researchers can observe 
that a change in the dependent variable occurred after the intervention was introduced. It's also easier to collect data with just one person than with many, and this type of design is compatible with social work topics. The disadvantages of this design are that we cannot rule out alternative explanations for results, such as selection bias, history, and maturation threats to internal validity. In addition, the data trends in single case evaluation designs are not always clear. Researchers will often aggregate the results of several single case evaluation designs in order to provide stronger evidence of the intervention's effect and to see if ambiguous results become more clear with more cases. A third type of quantitative research design is the cross-sectional study design. The purpose of cross-sectional study designs is to examine variables of interest at one point in time and compare groups of people or variables at this one point in time. So cross-sectional study designs are not usually focused on testing the effects of an intervention as group research designs are, but rather a cross-sectional design examines the relationship between variables or groups of people. For example, are there differences by racial and ethnic group in the length of time that youth are sentenced in the juvenile justice system? A cross-sectional study could be used to obtain administrative data on racial and ethnic group and sentence length. A researcher could then examine whether or not there are statistically significant differences between race, ethnicity, and sentence length. This would not be enough to say that one variable causes the other, but it might provide useful information for planning systems change. One of the main advantages to this type of design is that it is usually a quick and efficient way to gather data and establish a statistical correlation between variables. But of course, the disadvantage is low internal validity. Since the measurement happens at one point in time, we can't be sure that the cause precedes the effect in time. And we also cannot rule out the possible influence of a third underlying variable that is not being accounted for. The use of multivariate statistical tests can help address this issue because additional variables can be considered within one statistical test so that the possible confounding effects of other variables can be accounted for and controlled using statistical formulas. We'll be learning more about multi multivariate statistics later in the semester. Another type of quantitative research design is the longitudinal study design. A longitudinal study design follows people over time and gathers data at multiple time points. This type of design can be used to test the effects of an intervention or examine relationships between variables or groups of people. For example, the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth is a longitudinal study of Canadian children that follows their development from birth to early adulthood and examines relationships between variables such as family, peer, school, and community environments, and child well-being, including health, learning, and behavioral outcomes. And so a strength of longitudinal designs is that researchers can observe the time ordering of events and can determine if an independent variable precedes the dependent variable in time. But because data are collected over several time periods, longitudinal studies are costly and often difficult to conduct and therefore require significant funding and resources making them a challenging study to use in the context of social work. In addition, longitudinal studies are still subject to history and maturation threats to internal validity, because it is still possible that some third underlying variable is the actual cause of the relationship between an independent and a dependent variable. Like cross-sectional studies, longitudinal studies often incorporate multivariate statistical tests to help measure and control for the effects of possible confounding variables. A fifth type of quantitative research design is the case control study design, which examines retrospective data that is collected at one point in time from a group of people. Like cross-sectional studies, case control studies collect data at a single point in time, but these data are from one or more time periods in the past. For example, a case control study design could be used to answer a research question like, 
Among adults who were involved in the foster care system as adolescents, what is the relationship between the number of placement changes they had and their current involvement in the criminal justice system? The main advantage of case control designs is that you can collect data at one point in time, which makes this study much easier than a longitudinal design. The main disadvantage is that this design is still subject to selection bias, history, and maturation threats to internal validity. Because the data are collected retrospectively, it is often difficult to determine if the independent variable came before the dependent variable. Like cross-sectional and longitudinal designs, case control designs often use multivariate statistical tests to help measure and control the effects of possible confounding variables. A concluding concept for this session is that of external validity. So far, this session has been focused on the internal validity of a study and how well aspects of the research design help to establish a causal relationship between an independent and a dependent variable. External validity is something different and reflects the degree to which the results of a study can be generalized or applied to other populations in different settings. External validity is a key research concept in the social work profession because so much social work research is focused on evaluating programs and we need to be able to determine if a program can be effective across different types of populations. We'll be returning to the topic of external validity in later sessions when we cover topics such as sampling, measurement, and data collection, which are all key research active approaches. A descriptive research approach could be used with research questions like, what is the average age of children entering the public child welfare system in California? What proportion of youth entering the juvenile justice system in California are Latino, African American, white, or Asian Pacific Islander? What is the average length of stay at a residential treatment center for adults with mental illness? All of these questions are focused on describing characteristics of certain client populations. A second research approach is an exploratory approach, which asks open-ended research questions that are focused on learning more about a topic that we do not know much about, or also exploring a topic that is hard to study using other research approaches, including topics that explore things like perceptions, experiences, feelings, or processes. An exploratory approach can be used in order to learn enough about a topic an evaluative research approach is specifically focused on research that produces results that can be readily used in order to make program and policy decisions. An evaluative approach to research incorporates at least one of the other three research approaches. However, evaluative research questions are tailored for producing results that can be used for policy and program decisions and are therefore usually narrow and specific. Examples of evaluative research questions include, after six months of new recruitment activities, including print and media ads for potential foster parents, what is the percent change in foster parent orientation attendance? What is the average age of mothers participating in a postpartum support program? What do social workers who are implementing a new program feel are the strengths and challenges in the implementation of the program? Welcome to Social Work 240, Session 2. This module will include definitions and examples of research approaches, research methods, and five quantitative research designs. Each of these different terms reflects different choices a researcher can make about how to conduct a research study. We'll begin by discussing the four types of research approaches. First, descriptive research is used when the research question is focused on describing characteristics of a population or phenomenon. Descriptive research is not focused on examining things like program effectiveness, but rather on describing characteristics of program participants or program practices. Descriptive research is most often used as a way to learn about a research topic so that other additional research questions can be asked using exploratory, explanatory, or value causes a change in the dependent variable. A dependent variable is something that is changed by the independent variable. 
Explanatory research begins with an hypothesis about how the independent and the dependent variables are related to one another. An explanatory research approach could be used with hypotheses like, it is hypothesized that participation in triple P parenting classes, the independent variable, will improve parenting skills, the dependent variable. It is hypothesized that participation in mental health counseling, the independent variable, will reduce anxiety and depression, the dependent variables, among adults. It is hypothesized that cultural competence training, the independent variable, will increase social worker skills, the dependent variable. These hypotheses are specific predictions about how an independent variable will influence a dependent variable. To then conduct additional research, but for other topics, an exploratory approach is the main goal. An exploratory research approach could be used with questions like, how do parents who are recent immigrants from Mexico cope with acculturation challenges? How satisfied are adolescent foster youth with their social workers' efforts at finding a permanent home for them? What factors help facilitate cross-system collaboration between child welfare and mental health systems? These questions are focused on exploring experiences, processes, feelings, and perceptions and are also focused on topics that we do not know much about. An explanatory research approach begins with a specific idea or prediction about how variables are related to one another. Within an explanatory research approach, we use the terms independent and dependent variables. An independent variable is something that 